When I first heard about the summer of math exposition, and I read that we were supposed to make videos on math or computer science or physics, I immediately decided to break the rules and make a video on chemistry. But stick with me, since I think there's some satisfying connections between math and chemistry that are underexplored in the math YouTube world. What this video will cover was first established decades ago and has led to an entire field in chemistry, but I haven't been able to find any videos about it in this style, and I think that we can still learn something from it. First, let's start with some basic graph theory. I want to stress that I am selecting just the concepts relevant to the rest of the video to discuss here, and for a more formal and complete introduction, there are many excellent resources out there, some of which I will link in the description. Graph theory is a branch of mathematics that studies graphs. Well, not that type of graph. Graph here refers to a structure that describes relationships between a set of objects, often represented as shown here, a set of vertices connected by edges. These are useful for a variety of applications, as they efficiently represent networks, whether they be friends on a social media app or roads on a map. There are a number of important properties and operations associated with these graphs, but the one I want to focus on today are matchings. Matchings are sets of edges that don't share endpoints. In other words, each edge matches a distinct pair of vertices. A matching is said to be perfect when all vertices in the graph are matched in this way. Now let's find the perfect matching for this special type of graph, a cycle graph, whose edges form a closed loop. The only way to achieve a perfect matching here is to select three alternating sides, since any other selection of edges will either violate our definition of a matching, or not be perfect. Some of you might have noticed by now that this looks quite similar to the Kekulé structure of benzene. It also then becomes apparent that the other resonance structure is also a perfect matching of our initial cycle graph. There are some useful consequences that arise when thinking about double bonds as matchings of a graph, but first I'm going to take a minute to give a brief overview of the basics of covalent bonding and resonance structures. If you already feel comfortable with the chemistry involved, please feel free to skip ahead to the timestamp on the screen. We usually describe molecules as atoms bound together by these chemical bonds, each of which are two electrons being shared between the atoms connected by the bond. By following the rows and columns of a periodic table, we can see that each atom has a number of initial valence electrons, and for a molecule to be stable, each atom wants to end up with a certain number of electrons. Since we'll only deal with carbon and hydrogen, what you need to remember is that each carbon starts with four valence electrons and wants to end with eight, while hydrogen starts with one and wants to end with two. Let's take another look at the benzene molecule. We have six carbons, which contributes a total of 24 electrons, and six hydrogens, which brings the total up to 30. A valid chemical structure of benzene will have this arrangement of atoms with bonds that satisfies the end requirements of each atom while only using these 30 electrons. The bonds already drawn use up 24 and are required to keep the same overall structure, but each carbon in this configuration only has six electrons, too short from the desired eight. We can draw the double bonds shown before to use the remaining six electrons and satisfy each carbon. You'll see that there are two distinct ways to draw the double bonds and still satisfy all requirements. This is what we call a resonance structure, and molecules with these rings in particular are called aromatic. In reality, neither structure is entirely accurate. Benzene does not have three single bonds and three double bonds. Rather, all six bonds are identical, indicating that the true structure of benzene is something in between the two resonance structures, which is why some people prefer to draw benzene with a circular ring in the middle. The six electrons in these double bonds, called pi electrons due to the orbitals they occupy, are not held in bonds but are rather delocalized in a series of orbitals. The specifics of how this works are not relevant for now, but it is important to know that resonance structures are generally indicative of stability, as the more spread out these electrons are, the less they will repel each other. Again, remember that this is an abridged and incomplete explanation. If you want to learn more about these topics, I will have some resources linked in the description. What I've covered so far is hopefully an interesting overlap between graph theory and chemistry, but you'd be correct in thinking that just noticing that both perfect matchings and aromatic rings have alternating edges is not particularly significant. These connections can be extended further, however, and to illustrate that, let's introduce two new molecules, anthracene, which can be found in coal tar, and phenanthrene, which is the backbone of many botanical compounds. For the sake of clarity, these diagrams do not explicitly write out each carbon and hydrogen. Each vertex in the diagram contains a carbon, and hydrogen is implied to be attached to that carbon if it's necessary to complete its octet. Just by looking at these structures, you can probably tell that they are very similar. 
They share the same number of carbons and hydrogens and are both composed of three aromatic rings, with the only difference being how they are joined. Let's go ahead and turn these structures into graphs. There are many methods and algorithms one could use to find perfect matchings for these graphs, but to save time, I'll just go ahead and show all of them for you. If you'd like to try it yourself, or if you don't trust me, you can pause and find them yourself for a good exercise. As I start to show the perfect matchings of anthracene, I'm going to keep account of how many we find. Now we'll go on to the perfect matchings for phenanthrene. You'll notice that phenanthrene has one more perfect matching than anthracene, which, using our previous analogy, means that phenanthrene's electrons are, in a sense, distributed across more resonance structures. This extra resonance structure indicates that the electrons are more delocalized and that the molecule is most likely more stable. Experimental data confirms that phenanthrene is indeed more stable than anthracene. In fact, this pattern holds for most non-overly complex aromatic compounds. More perfect matchings typically indicates a more stable molecule. Looking at perfect matchings can also tell us how these pi electrons are distributed. This can be done by calculating a number that's termed the face abundance. First, we'll associate each edge with a hexagonal face. For edges shared by two faces, we'll cut each edge in half. Now, let's go through each perfect matching for phenanthrene again, but this time we'll count how many times each edge appears, and for the edges we cut in half, we'll just count that as a half for the two faces that share that edge. We can find an average of how many edges each face contributed to perfect matchings by summing all of the edges for each face and dividing by the number of perfect matchings, which was in this case 5. Multiplying this by 2, since each bond has 2 electrons, we get the abundance of each face, which is on average how many electrons each hexagonal ring was given by each resonance structure. This value allows us to approximate the true structure of this molecule in just one diagram. The first drawing I showed with the three circles, while often used, is not exactly accurate as each ring does not have the same density of pi electrons. These numbers allow for a more accurate representation of how the pi electrons are distributed within this molecule. Finally, I want to leave you with a few key points that I think this exhibits. First, I think this is a good example of how math can simplify science. Oftentimes when I think of math and science, I think of painfully complex equations that are usually necessary to quantify intuition. But that's not the case here. Sometimes mathematical structures can codify qualitative intuition. The math we've done in this video will not be able to tell you how much more stable one molecule is over another, and the abundance numbers we've calculated are by no means exact values. But what the math can do is capture in a beautifully simple manner the intuition a chemist would normally use to address these questions. And this can be very useful. For example, it can be quite difficult to analyze fullerenes, which are these large closed carbon meshes with hexagonal and pentagonal faces that are constructed with single and double bonds in a similar manner to the molecules we looked at today. There are an incomprehensible number of different types of fullerenes, and predicting their properties is not realistic to do with the traditional, more chemically robust methods of predicting stability or electron distribution. This is where the simplicity of graph theory comes in handy, as algorithms are much easier to construct working with points and lines. Of course, the chemistry is much more complex for fullerenes than what we've done here, but graph theory can still describe it well with just a little more legwork. And as a final note for any aspiring mathematicians or math communicators watching, I think there's a lot of interesting math and chemistry that's overlooked in favor of other fields. So don't forget about us chemists. It can get lonely out there. Anyways, thank you for watching.